Hello, dear friends. Hello, St. Timothy's. Coming to you on Wednesday, April 29th, the Feast of St. Catherine of Siena. And I want to spend just a few moments with some um, news, some updates, and some catechesis. Clearly, I'm coming to you from an empty St. Timothy's. As we published a video last week, the pews were removed, disassembled and removed. The reverdos has been removed. Um, right now, the altar rail is in the process of being extracted so it can be um, placed in Drake Hall for a, a communion rail. Of course, you can't see behind you, but the organ is completely wrapped and the church is ready for construction to begin next week as we'll begin this this wonderful process of the holiness of beauty to continue to transform this, our parish home, into a place of, of real prayer and pilgrimage and where the sacraments are celebrated with reverence, holiness, and where new life is communicated through our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in sitting here, I recognize there are two ways you can look at this scene. You can look at it as an example of everything else that's been going on in our lives. Everything's been stripped away. Everything's been removed or taken away. Or you could look at this and see it as a blank canvas for something beautiful and extraordinary and new to happen. This coming Sunday, I'm going to preach about the will of God. And I'm going to say that the will of God, of course, is a mystery. Whenever we speak about the will of God, we have to approach it with both humility and imagination. Humility in that we can never fully understand, and imagination in that God's will is far greater than, than we could ever conceive. And sometimes we assume that a mystery is something where there's not enough information, but I think it's the exact opposite. A mystery is where there's too much information, but our finite minds and our limited perspective simply can't comprehend it all. All the information is there, but it's too much for us to process. And whenever we find ourselves in any situation in life, the mystery of God is constantly around us. God's will, God's love, God's providence, God's plan is constantly communicated, but our finite minds our limited perspective, our oftentimes inward focus keeps us from being able to, to process the greater picture, the most beautiful story that God has in store for us. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about during this, this stay-at-home period is, like most of you, I've been spending a little bit more time at home doing a lot of work um, in, in the house. And one of the joys has been spending more time with my children, playing basketball with Abby, wrestling with the boys on a daily basis. And, um, and maybe I'm spending more time with them than, than they would like. I came home yesterday. I worked a, a regular day, about um, 10 to 11 hours, and I came home and, and made the comment to one of my children. I won't tell you which one. Um, I've been gone all day. And that child said, yeah, it's been kind of nice to be honest with you. But one of the things that I was thinking about is how wonderful it is that we're spending um, all this time together. But I wondered to myself, am I really gone that much? And I am gone a lot. But what occurred to me was they're not gone as much, the children. You know, like a modern family, every child has some activity Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We have this event or this practice or this extracurricular activity. And now that they're all gone, we're all here together. And so as an example of things that seem to have been taken away, something really beautiful is emerging. We're going back to the basics. We're spending time together. We're playing. We're doing what families have been doing for an awful long time. And one of the great gifts that is becoming clearer to me during this corona tide is that in the parish, my thoughts are frequently going back to the basics as to what we should be doing as a church. 
The first lesson for this Sunday is a powerful lesson, and it's one that I'm not going to be able to touch, which is why I'm happy to do some teaching and catechesis now. It comes from the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. We typically would read this at the end of the story of Pentecost, and there's a line in this text which you've heard before. It's in the baptismal covenant and our baptismal liturgy, but interestingly, we only hear this verse one time in three years of Sunday mornings, and that's this coming Sunday. It's from Acts chapter 2, um, beginning with verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all as any had, ne had need. And day by day, attending to the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. When you read this, these verses in context in all of chapter 2, this is after the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles, after they begin preaching and proclaiming to all who are around who Jesus Christ was about his resurrection from the dead and the new life that we find in him, people, as we're told, were cut to the heart and they wanted to know to how to have this life. And Peter says, repent and be baptized, and they were. And then it's from that point, going back to the beginning to the basics, here is what they did. They devoted themselves to what the apostles taught them, because they they were the eyewitnesses of Jesus to, to Jesus Christ. They devoted themselves to the fellowship that comes with this teaching, the breaking of bread, the Holy Eucharist, and to the prayers. Those were the basics. I find myself during this time thinking about those three things, not trying to do some sort of study into Acts 2, but out of necessity. Trying to think, how can, since we're not together, how can I communicate the, the power and the message of our faith, especially during a time such as this. So the apostles' teaching, catechesis, is forefront on my mind, like doing the webinar last Monday night and, and trying to find ways in which we can teach and how we can grow together in the Bible. It's, it's different now. I mean, no one has been trained in, in doing church this way. We're having to discover it on our own, but that's something that's constantly on my mind. How can we keep the teaching, the, the catechesis, up, and how can we do it together? Fellowship, checking in on one another, and you've done an excellent job because you let me know who you talk to, checking in on those who may not have family nearby to check in on them. Um, how do we stay in community together when, by law, we're not allowed to be in community together? It's so much a part of our Christian identity. And here's the one that's been the most challenging. How do we stay connected to the Holy Eucharist when we're not, as a parish, able to come together to celebrate it? These are the things that are constantly on my mind. How do we elevate and teach that in the Eucharist we have the source and summit of our life? How do we teach the faith? How is the Bible revealed through the person of Jesus Christ? And how do we grow together? The Apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. I think this has been a good thing for us because of all the things that we normally try to think about or have to think about as a, as a parish family, as the rector, as our staff, oftentimes the things that, that are urgent but aren't always important are superfluous. They don't deal with the apostles' teaching and fellowship. They don't deal with the Holy Eucharist. They don't deal with the prayers. So when everything's been stripped away, it's now this wonderful canvas to start again, for renewal. As St. Paul said to Timothy, rekindle the gift that is in you. So during this time, that's what we're doing both inwardly spiritually, but also outwardly physically. And clearly this space is empty, ready for, ready for something new. And as we're doing this, 
Every single building on our campus is going through some sort of transformation. Everything is being touched. Right now, Drake Hall is in the process of being transformed. Uh, the chapel, which is a part of the capital campaign with new doors and there'll be some paint on the inside, is being renewed. Ribbon Commons is being renewed. Every part of our campus is being touched. The cemetery for the Society of St. Joseph of Arimathea, it's now finished, just waiting for the burials to begin. And it's extraordinary, extraordinarily exciting. It's terrifying, but everything that is new, everything that has meaning, always comes with a bit of healthy and holy fear and trembling. Remember what we're told in Acts 2. Fear was upon every soul. Not that they were scared so much, but we're now entering into something that is bigger than ourselves that we can't control. And giving up that control and being open to something new can be scary. That's a good thing for us. So I hope for you, you can find a way for renewal. It's going to be challenging. Um, one of my concerns is how do we come back together? And that's one of the things I wanted, wanted to talk about. Someone, one of my colleagues once said online that right now our long-range planning consists of 10 to 14 days. And I think he's absolutely right. So if you were to ask me my long-range plan, that's going to take us to, to the middle of May. The Bishop of North Carolina has said that um, we were to not have public worship in, until May 17th. It is um, my gut that will be extended. How long? I don't know. If I had to guess, and I'm guessing, it'll be June before we come back. And when we come back, my guess is our, our reinstitution will mirror that of what we're seeing in states across the country, meaning we'll come back in phases, come back in waves. So that may mean, and let me just emphasize may, because I have only a 10 to 14 day long range plan, that may mean that we have more liturgies on a Sunday, but you need to register for the ones that you're going to attend because we'll need to limit the number of people who will be there and we'll need to prepare so families, for instance, can sit together. Um, but individuals will need to have appropriate social distancing based upon the guidelines that we have been given by the government. So we're waiting really for those parameters and guidelines to be given so then we can make plans. I think we'll all be in Drake Hall for several months for a couple of reasons. One, it's easier to do distancing and to make sure that we're all in a, in a safe um, space in Drake Hall because we'll be using chairs. The other thing is, I think it will be good for us for a season to all be in one space, neither in the, in the church I'm in now or the chapel, so that we can, so that we can come to, to to be under that one umbrella of St. Timothy's. Um, I'm not worried about any church having multiple congregations in it, because that's going to happen. Whatever service you go to, that's your community, that's the local congregation. But we need to remember, and sometimes it's easy to forget, that we're all members of St. Timothy's, and we're all united in the faith and mission that's been given to this parish. And so I think for a while that will be good for us to, to come together under in, in one space. The liturgies will, will continue to reflect the diversity of our piety, um, but um, it, will, it will have to be different just because of where we are. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, we'll continue to broadcast and record liturgies for the foreseeable future. One thing that I did not anticipate as we began is that, I mean, I sort of assumed that once this was over, we'd all come back. All 315 of us on an average Sunday morning will come back and, and it would just have been um, a pause in our life. I don't think that's going to happen. Many of you have communicated to me, especially if you're in the, in the more vulnerable segment of our population, that you may take your time coming back, and I understand that. Some have said that you're not necessarily comfortable returning to church until you have a vaccine. I understand um, that as well. So we'll continue to, to broadcast um, the liturgies for those who legitimately do not need to be leaving their homes until we have some medical advances. My anxiety is I don't want us to get too comfortable of YouTubing the liturgy. Um, a YouTube Eucharist is not the Holy Eucharist. 
There's a great line in one of our, um, the church's most beloved hymns, the Pange Lingua, which talks about the Holy Eucharist, and it says, types and shadows have their ending, for the newer rite is here. Meaning that in all the Old Testament, we were foreshadowing and looking toward this great gift of our Lord being uh, with us and being with us sacramentally. Well, the types and shadows can end because now the thing is actually here. When we do this on Facebook and on YouTube, we're, we're adding a type and shadow back. It is an image of the Holy Eucharist, but it's not the same thing. And I don't want us to ever get comfortable with watching it on, online. Um, I know it's hard. Um, it's hard for me to watch a full liturgy online. And I know that we get in habits of being able to watch it whenever we want to or, or, um, or, or fast forward through the parts that we're not terribly interested in. I want us, if you would, to sort of check yourself on those, on those habits. I find myself, I, I, told, I told Sherilyn um, Sunday, usually on Sunday morning, I'm up at 5.30 and I'm at church by 6.30, morning prayers at 7, masses at 7.30, and it's a long day. And during Corona tide, I'm not getting up until 7.30. And you know what, I really like it. And I wondered how difficult it will be for me to go back to our regular routine because I will have established new muscle memory new practices, a new routine, and faith is discipline. And please do whatever you can on Sundays to keep your routine together. I know it's not the same. You know, I miss working out at the gym, and I know that push-ups are not the same thing as the bench press, but it's all I've got right now. And I know when I go back to the gym, I am going to be so much weaker than I was before, but I can do my part with what I can at home. Spiritually, it's the same thing. YouTube, Facebook, it's not the Holy Eucharist. I'm the first to say that. And I understand if it's not the same, it doesn't draw us in. But we need to do what we can to keep that up so that when we are able to come back, we will not have established new routines, new muscle memory, that it's even more difficult for us um, to come back. Some updates of what's been going on in the church. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your stewardship and your giving. I've, as, I, as I've said many times, I'm, I'm not a TV preacher, but, but guess what? Now I am, and I'm, I've been very conscious about asking for money to support the parish, and I've tried to be respectful, especially since um, so many of our medical professionals are now being furloughed, they're not being called in as much, and I live with one, and I know sort of intimately how, how that is working out and how much of a burden and challenge that you, you have, um, and our prayers are with you. Never imagine that during a pandemic, those medical professionals on the front line would have the additional struggle of, of not being able to work and having your pay cut. Um, it's a horrible, horrible thing. So many of you, though, have, have really stepped up and have kept up your pledge. You've, you've given early your stimulus check when it came in. You've, you've, you've tithed a portion of that when your, when your tax return came in. You did the same. And so we're holding our own, so we appreciate that. Um, we have applied for the payroll protection program. We missed the first round, like nearly every other church that I'm aware of, and most every church that I know has done the same thing. We're in the pipeline, we're in the queue, we hope to get that, which would be a great gift for us, because right now our giving is sustaining our staff. We haven't laid anyone off, including our nursery workers, including our choral scholars. Um, we've kept everyone on, which is a, a just and, and right thing to do, but our giving is sustaining just that. The longer we go in, the more this is gonna cut into what we can do in our mission, which we don't want to happen. So the payroll protection program is this gift from heaven. It reminds me of this line from, from um, the prophet Haggai about rebuilding the temple and says, you know, the, the gold is mine and the silver is mine and I will shake the heavens and it will come down. In, in many ways, the payroll protection program is this great gift that will help us and so many other churches to sustain our personnel um, so they're not unemployed, but also to continue our mission. So we do hope that will come through soon as of right now. They just restarted it this week. We haven't, we haven't heard anything. Um, the, the police have been using St. Timothy's even more now. I was here on, on um, Saturday night and I ran into one of our um, officers, one of our sergeants, uh, a female sergeant who thanked me even more for not shutting it down because she said, um, every business is 
of course, closed. So the practical things like finding a restroom during your shift has become even more complicated. And so they're using it more because they know this place is open, they know it's clean, and they know it's a safe place for them. Um, and so that ministry continues. The Society of St. Joseph of Arimathea, I put this on Facebook yesterday. I picked up six more babies from Haywith Miller yesterday, 30 this year already, 81 since we've started, um, and 18 this year who were unclaimed. Your, your fidelity to that has been wonderful. I received two, two, um, two contributions from, um, from um, groups outside the church last week, and that fund is doing, is doing okay. So thank you for your support on that. On communication, gosh, it's hard, isn't it? I will send out an email every week with links to watch the service on, on YouTube or Facebook. If we do a Bible study, I'll give you the Zoom link for that. For our parish check-ins every two weeks, I'll give you the link for that. So do check, do check your email. Um, Facebook is not the primary means of, of news. It's the primary means of day-to-day -day stories. But if it's something I need you to know, the only way I can communicate with you now is via email. We're trying to find a way to mail something out, but it always complicates things because to send a mailing out requires multiple people. So we're doing the best we can on that. So thank you for, for checking the, the, communication, um, the communication links as we're doing our best to stay together so that we can be devoted to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. Guys, I'm gonna tell you, I, I'm feeling very, very hopeful and very excited. In the beginning, my spirits were going down. Um, but now that we, are, we have this, some, some perspective and can kind of see how this taking of everything away, if we allow God to work within us, can be this brand new canvas, not only for the building, but more importantly for all of us to renew our souls, to renew our commitment, to renew the life and joy that we found with each other in this parish. So that makes me very hopeful and very excited. And in a strange way that is a mystery in God's will, this very difficult time may end up being a gift for us. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Please keep sending your texts, calls, emails, um, and any way that we can stay together is a great joy to me. I miss you all and love you very much.